We're going to turn to 1 Peter tonight, 1 Peter tonight. We're not really necessarily doing any type of a series, but uh, Lord willing, uh, I will be downstairs two more Wednesdays. And uh, every time I talk to Charlie, I mentioned that, and again, it's, now, it's beyond his control. Uh, his brother uh, is scheduled as of now. A tentative date, release date is November the 10th. Uh, that's tentative. It still could change. And then at that point, they would drive down, uh, I believe drive or fly down to right near Shelby, Lattimore, near Ambassador, where Charlie's parents live. And then he would probably have to stay there with his brother a week to two weeks, two and a half weeks. Uh, we've heard different things there. So I'm, anticipa- I'm not anticipating, yes. You gave it update, so they're all like, okay, we heard this, all right. Okay, so we'll see. I'm, I'm not anticipating, we'll just sort of see. I, I'm anticipating maybe, depending on when he gets down there, if he's going to be with his family for Thanksgiving. So as of now, two more weeks down with the young people. Of course, we have a Tuesday night Thanksgiving praise service. That'll be everybody. There will be no Kids for Truth on that Wednesday. Everybody will be together, more of a family service. And then uh, back after Thanksgiving here on this first day of November. So keep the young people in your prayers. We have a great group down there. Uh, not that we're interested in numbers, but uh, been anywhere from uh, 12 to 15 to 16. We still haven't had everybody there uh, the same night, but uh, have a good group. They listen well. They're excited about the Bible. They're excited about learning their books of the Bible. There's a good spirit among them, and teachers doing a great job. So keep them in your prayer, and the young people as well as your teachers. First Peter chapter 1, 1 Peter chapter 1. Oh, you might have already mentioned this, but I'll mention it all again. We will need some help right after the service if you don't need to slip off. Obviously, if you've got kiddos and you need to get them home, that is perfectly fine. Get them home, get them to rest for school. And, but if we can get some help, we've got to get them rooms ready and moving things around for ladies' seminar and the book rooms and all of that. So if you can stay around a little bit afterwards, that would be great. We'll let you know what needs done and uh, all of that. Okay, First Peter chapter number 1, First Peter chapter number 1. And we're on November the 1st, which means there's a new verse of the month. So our verse of the month, I'm going to be preaching on our verse of the month and the verses surrounding it. All right. So our new verse of the month, for those who have been memorizing or would like to memorize, is 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 23. Verse 23. So I'm going to read that verse, and then we're going to go back and get a little context. And that'll be sort of where we're, our thrust is tonight. Okay. So our verse of the month, 1 Peter 1, 23. The Bible says, being born again... Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. So, not a long verse. We've been sort of back and forth. Uh, no, December's will we'll finish out the year with a little longer, harder one. All right? But uh, sometimes there's a longer one, a little more challenging. Some are, like last month's, not that difficult. And so this one is not that long. Many of you could probably, if you've never memorized it, you'll be memorizing it during my preaching and then say it right after the service. All right? Um, but being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Let's have a word of prayer. Father, as we look in your word tonight, we thank you that your word is incorruptible because you are incorruptible. You're eternal. Your word is eternal. Lord, we thank you that your word is always correct, always true, always trustworthy, without error, because Lord, you are always true, without error, without contradiction. Lord, the word of God is your word, every word, every Lord, jot, every tittle, God breathe. You're the source. We can trust it explicitly. Lord, we may not understand everything. There'll be some things that, Lord, no doubt will throw us for a loop, but I pray that our confidence is in you, God, and your character, and that we love you and know your word. Now, Lord, help us tonight as we look a little bit into 1 Peter chapter 1. Help us not just to understand the verse of the month, but, Lord, the whole context of the chapter and the great salvation that we have through the Lord Jesus Christ. And we'll thank you. Speak through me now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. First Peter, let's get a little overview. I've preached on this, pastors preached on this, many of you have preached on this or heard preaching on it, but instead of just pulling out the verse, let's do a quick synopsis. We're not going to go through the whole chapter, but let's just go back a little bit. Chapter 1, verse 1, get a little understanding of what is that verse meaning, why is it where it's at. As you'll notice uh, in verse 23, it's part of a larger sentence or paragraph because Verse 22 ends in a semi or a colon, so it, it's, we don't want to just take the verse out of where it needs to be. So, 1 Peter, verse 1, author is Peter, Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, who's he writing to? To the strangers scattered throughout, and he mentions several different areas, regions, places in that part of the world. 
So, believers who have been scattered by persecution primarily here. These books are generally believed to have been written right after Paul's epistles. So probably within a few years, one to five years after Paul likely was martyred. Uh, when the Roman Empire really began to ramp up persecution against Christians, followers of Christ, followers of Paul, followers of... So obviously, if you're going to be one of the disciples, one of the apostles, and you're going to be a believer, so persecution was really coming. He's writing to the strangers, fellow Christians who've been scattered throughout that area. Notice some of the key words, verse 2, elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. He's talking about those who are saved. Verse number 3, blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope. Some have said that John is the apostle of love, Paul the apostle of faith, and some say Peter, the apostle of hope. If you read his epistles there, all right? And Paul, Peter likes to talk about this. Here he says, a lively hope or a living hope, not a dead hope. And so he's writing to believers, Christians, those who have been born again. How do we know that? Well, you can see it a lot. Verse 5, he's mentioned salvation. Verse 9, salvation. Verse 10, salvation. Verse 18, those who were redeemed. Verse 19, the precious blood of Christ. So he's writing to believers, fellow believers, people who have been born again, who have trusted Christ, who've been redeemed, who have been saved. That is the audience Take a look at verse number four. This gets you really exciting here. Not only do we have a lively hope, but notice verse four. To an inheritance incorruptible, undefiled, fadeth not away, reserved in heaven for you. Boy, right there. I mean, that should be glory. Hallelujah. Even on a Wednesday night where you're worn out from work and tired and thinking about getting home and school and snow and cold and not feeling good. Whoa. We have a lively hope. Why? Through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. We have an inheritance, incorruptible, cannot be defiled, can't be taken away, can't be changed, can't die, can't be stolen. It's undefiled. It doesn't fade away. It's reserved. That means it's held fast. It's reserved in, in the last time. I'm sorry, I'm looking at the wrong. Reserved in heaven for you. I'm, I'm jumping into verse 5. And notice verse 5. Who are kept... By the power of God. Your salvation, you're not keeping yourself saved. We're kept, guarded, protected, hemmed in by the very power of God through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time. No, so what is Peter doing? Peter, the apostle here, through dark persecution. I mean, people being killed, being arrested. Uh, Paul martyred. Other of the apostles perhaps martyred already. Their days are numbered. Peter's days are numbered. They're rounding them up in mass. Christians are scattering. They're wondering, what are we doing? Is this the way it's supposed to be? Where are you, God? What's going on? And Peter saying, we have a living hope. We need to keep our eyes on not just right now and look around and say, oh my goodness, what's going on? Where are you, God? Look at verse 6. Wherein ye greatly rejoice... How do we rejoice during great persecution? If right now, you, you're, if you owned a job, it was, you lost it. You lost your business, you lost your house, you lost your property, your bank accounts, everything is gone. It's all shut down. They took it. Your cars, your vehicles, you escape with your life. You're on your own now. you got nothing. Your credit cards don't work. They're coming for you. Maybe you have some friends. Maybe you're like, well, they're going to track me down. Where am I going to go? I wonder how you'd be feeling. You know, you find out you, some friends are already arrested. They're rounding people up. You can't believe this. What's going on? You don't know where to turn. So maybe you, you got enough gas in your car. You're going to try to drive somewhere, out of state, find somewhere. Uh, well, you're scattered. You, you can't contact people like you used to. Your cell phone doesn't work. What's going on? You're like, oh, my goodness. God, where are you? I thought, I thought you, you know, let's go with the times here. Rampant persecution. People being arrested and killed. They're questioning. Here's this epistle written. You need to greatly rejoice, verse 6, though now for a season. If need be, you're in heaviness. You're discouraged, depressed, weary, anxious, fretting, lonely, sorrowing through manifold temptations. Oh, my goodness. Verse 7, that the trial of your faith. Notice what's being tested. Your faith. 
Now, we are, you gotta, what are you holding on to? Not, your salvation's not in danger. It's kept. It's reserved. Not the future. Heaven awaits you. Your inheritance is sure. But your faith, your present faith is being tempted and tested, being much more precious, verse 7, than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire. Wow, the heat has been turned up. We were doing a family devotion the other night, and uh, you probably asked yourself, how do you know you have faith? Now, I'm not talking about saving faith. Or you say, hey, I was saved back, and you maybe remember the occasion. I was this age. I was here. I was there. I remember. I'm not talking about saving faith, praise God. I'm talking about your daily walk by faith. How do you know that you have faith? How do you know if it's strong or not? There is no way to know that unless it's tested. I mean, how do you know you love God with all your heart? How do you know you wouldn't question him? How do you know that? Unless you're tested severely like a Job. Then you're going to find out, right? Are you going to accuse God? Are you going to question God? How, how do you know that if you're not tested? Many times as believers, we don't want to be tested. We, we resist the test. No, Lord, no, I want no. <laughs> no. But God tests us, not for him to know. God knows where our faith is. He already knows Linda's faith. He knows Jane's. He knows if it's weak, if it's little, if it's strong. But you and I don't. We might think we're good. I would never do that. I'd never curse God and die. I'd never abandon God. I'd never charge God foolishly. I would never one time shake my fist. Really? How do we know that? I would like to think I wouldn't. How do you know? What if everything was taken away? What if you're in a car accident, you're paralyzed, and you're neck down? What if you're in a wheelchair for three years? You, would you not get, not get mad at God? You would never question Him. You wouldn't shake your fist. Say this isn't fair. How do we know? How do we know? We don't know. We we think we know. We we pretty sure we wouldn't. But our faith. Tested. Tested. We'll jump through the next few verses. You want to try to get to, again, our verse. But notice what he's going on. Pick up the theme of the, the book here. Notice what is going on. He's talking about their salvation. Verse 13. Verse 13. We jump ahead a little bit here. Wherefore, wherefore, gird up the loins of your mind. Your mind. Be sober. Sound in your thinking. Biblical in your thinking. And hope, there's that hope again, hope to the end for the grace that is to be brought unto you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, not disobedient, as obedient children, not fashioning yourselves according to the former lust, so not living daily or thinking daily as you did before you were saved, your former lust and desires, the things when you were ignorant and lost, that's not how you should be walking daily, although that would be normal when you go through temptation. When you go through trial, you're going to resort to what's natural. You're going to go with basic instinct. You're going to fall back onto what you used to do. You know, I've got to get myself out of this situation. Uh, I, I've got, he said, whoa, whoa, whoa. As obedient children, not living and walking and, and operating the way you formerly did, verse 15, but as he which hath called you is holy, so be ye holy in all manner of conversation, all manner of living. All manner of thinking and acting, daily obedience, be set apart, holy, because it is written, be ye holy, for I am holy. Okay, so you can see what's going on here, verse 18 through verse 21, tremendous verses. For as much as you know that you are not redeemed, you were not purchased, your salvation was not with corruptible things, as silver and gold. Nobody bought it, you didn't purchase it. Nobody paid for it, you didn't inherit it as silver and gold from your vain or empty, worthless conversation and lifestyle received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ. As of a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was manifest, was revealed in these last times for you, who by him do believe in God, that raised him up from the dead and gave him glory. Notice again, hope that your faith and hope might be in God. Now, I know the answer everybody would give tonight. Is your faith and hope in God? Yes, you, do. you answer without thinking. But is your faith and hope in God? How do you know that? Are you strong enough in your faith to say, God, test me? Test me this week. Lord, I want to know. I want to make sure that my faith and hope is in you. I mean, in you now. In you. 
Nothing else. So, Lord, well, that might be a challenge for some. I'm not saying you need to, but, Lord, I don't even know myself. I think I know myself, but I don't. You know. So, Lord, I want to make sure that my faith, my hope is in God. It rests solely in God. Now, that brings us to the conclusion of the first chapter, which is going to be our verse here. I want to make sure we sort of see the point. We're going through it quick. We didn't cover everything, but just a quick overview to believers who were redeemed with the blood of Christ, going through trials and temptations, remembering Christ and the resurrection and the hope we have and our inheritance. We're kept by the power of God. So we come to this final conclusion of the chapter, verse 22. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit, unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently. Now that verse, the end of that verse doesn't seem like it should go with that. You know, the whole chapter is talking about salvation and redemption and the hope and the faith. And then, it, okay, great, the first part of that, seeing you have purified, that word there is the idea of sanctify, sanctification. You're made clean, you're made holy, you're made pure, you're, you're growing in Christ through what? The Spirit as you obey the Word. But then it mentions love of the brethren, you need to love one another with a pure heart fervently. And now we come to our verse because it's part of verse 22. It's all one thought. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Now, what is that? Why does that tie in with the rest of that? I mean, okay, I know we need to do that, but see that you love one another, fellow believers, with a pure heart fervently. Being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. And then we have the last two verses, which tie in with that verse. For all flesh is as grass, our flesh, our body. All flesh is just like grass, temporary. And all the glory of man as the flower of grass, right? All the glory of man. Wow, I wish I could be like that person. Oh, I wish I could be you know, Matthew Perry in the news. Wow, that was a great life. Or this athlete. All flesh like grass. The glory of man, all that we think is just whoo, like the flower of grass. The grass withereth, the flower thereof falleth away, but the word of the Lord endureth forever. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. Wow, that's a powerful first chapter. We, we just sort of did a quick <laughs> skim to get to the end here. It'd be for you to dig a little deeper uh, on your own or as a family or personal study there. But our verse, verse 23, ties in with verse 22. So for those of you that that would be an easy verse to memorize, great. Say that verse of the month and then memorize 22 and 23 with it. Or do 22, 23, 24, and 25. Test yourself. Do those four verses for yourself uh, if you'd like. All right? But what are we getting at here these last 10, 12 minutes tonight? What's the point? Okay, the verse. All right, being born again. That's, yeah, I believe that. Not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible. By the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Okay, that's great. There's some powerful truths in there. All right? But let's just take a little look here at these last four verses. So verse 22. Everything here is laid upon the foundation of the first 21 verses. Its audience is believers. You're saved. You're saved by faith in Christ. You put your faith and trust in Christ, his finished work on Calvary. Your hope is in Christ and the fact that he's no longer dead, resurrected. Therefore, we not, not fear death. Or we, maybe we won't get resurrected. Maybe we're just going to die. No, 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 no. We're born again by Jesus Christ. We're redeemed with his blood. It's incorruptible. It's undefiled doesn't fade away. It's reserved. We're held fast. Has nothing to do with us. Has to do with Jesus Christ and what he did. It's secure. We're kept. No doubt about it. Things are going to happen all around us. There's many great trials. We could lose our life. We could lose our family. We could lose our fortune. That is not unknown to believers. That's not unknown in the scripture. Those things happen. You could be martyred for the cause of Christ. But you should greatly rejoice, and he's going and he's reminding these believers who probably going through much harder times than any of us are, or perhaps have. He's talking about salvation. Do not forget salvation, who it's through. You and I need to make sure we're living, whether good times or trying times, as obedient children 
living by the word of God, not our wits, not our feelings, not the way we used to, because oftentimes what do trials do? They expose us. They, they strip away what we appear to be or think we are, and then we can find out if we begin to grumble. And, and, and they, right, what happens, you've been in many science classes, what do you do with the Bunsen burner, right? Huh? They turn up the heat, turn up the heat. What happens? The impurities rise to the surface. Uh, the things that are not seen, they begin to come up through heat. The squeezing, uh-oh, whoa, look at all this stuff. Oh, how do we know that that stuff exists in our life unless we're, the heat's turned up? We, we, we look and, hey, I'm pretty good. I'm a pretty nice person. I'm friendly. I'm kind. I'm loving. Everything's great. God says, let's find out. I already know, but you don't know. I'm going to turn up the heat. Maybe it's persecution. Maybe it's trial. Maybe it's loss of something. And then all of a sudden, what happens? Then we're revealed. Maybe I do rejoice. Maybe I grumble. Maybe I grouse. Maybe I, who knows? Those things come to the surface. Maybe I turn to the word of God. Maybe I turn to prayer. Maybe I don't. Maybe I abandon the Bible. Maybe I don't pray. Maybe I stop coming to church. Whoa. Maybe I go back to the way I used to live, my former lust. And, I, and then I'm, I can't believe I even did that. And I'm shocked. And God says, no, I, I've known that's here all along. We need to scoop that away. You need to become like me. I mean, I'm revealing that. And so you're seeing what's happening here. And the reminder is your salvation is in Christ. Our hope is in Christ. Our faith and hope needs to be in Christ, not in our anything else, not in our health. I can be gone in a minute. Not in our church, not in our job, not in our money, not in our talents. None of our, that should not be how we make it through day after day, week after week. Those things can all be taken in a moment. Our faith and hope might be in God and God alone. Now, verse 22. This last part is like the end of the class application time. All right, students, you've, in class, you've just learned the notes. We covered the chapter. We gave you the, now it's zero in for you. Seeing, you're saved already. You're saved and you're kept. Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the Spirit. But that's just all right there tied up is the walk with God after salvation. That's sanctification. Becoming more like Christ in every area. Becoming clean and pure. Walking in Him. How do you do that? Through the Word of God. Obeying the truth. You don't have to obey the truth. I don't have to obey the truth. But by obeying the Word of God through the work of the Spirit, that makes the impurities come to the surface, that make God takes the sandpaper and smooths off the rest, rough edges of our personalities, of our character, the areas where we're weak, or areas where we're worldly, we're purified and cleansed and made like Him as we obey the truth through the Spirit. It's interesting, one of the next things that comes, this isn't a sign that you're saved, but it's a byproduct, a true love for the brethren. An unfeigned, unfeigned, not a word we use today much. Unfeigned means sincere. It's pure. It's, the, it's not, no hypocrisy. No two-faced about it. What you see is authentic and real. It's unfeigned. There's no pretending. I have a true, honest, sincere, without hypocrisy, love of the brethren. Whoa. Love of the brethren. God's people. My people. See that you love one another with a pure heart fervently. Whoa. Interesting, again, that that doesn't always seem like that should be right here in this chapter. It sort of seems out of place. And yet the Holy Spirit puts it here. You say you're growing. You say you love me. You say your faith and hope's in God. You say you're a true believer. How's your love for the brethren? Do you love the brethren? Do you love being with the brethren? Do you miss being with the brethren? Do you pray for the brethren? Do you think about the brethren? See then that you love one another with a pure heart, a pure heart, pure. How do you know if it's pure? God's going to turn that heat up. You're going to find out if it's pure or not. God's going to remove some things where you, you say, no, I think I'm, I'm okay with everybody. I think I love everybody. I think, I think there's not any, Really? And God's going to say, he'll, he'll expose that. He'll show you. He'll show me. With a pure heart, fervently, fervently, passionately. Why? Why? Verse 23, being born because you're saved. You were born again. Not of corruptible. Corruptible, not of anything that perisheth. 
And not, you, you weren't born again by anything you did or by anything that you inherited or by anything you could buy. It was completely of incorruptible by the word of God. If you were saved, you were saved by the word of God. The word of God. The truth of Scripture it doesn't mean the Word of God was present in a, in, in a book form necessarily. It doesn't mean you, you, but the Word of God, you heard the Word, the truth of God. The Word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. Think about that. That means, there's that phrase, born again. You think of that usually in the book of John. You must be born again. You must be born again. Except a man be born again. Born from above. I have to have that second birth, right? So, your first birth was physical, if you have a second birth, it's spiritual. Your first birth was of the flesh. Your second birth, if you have it, is of the spirit. Your first birth was of a man, woman or man. Your second birth is of God. Your first birth was you were born in sin, and sin did my mother conceive me. Your second birth was of incorruptible seed, the pure, un, as it says, they're redeemed with precious blood of Christ without sin. Your first birth was corruptible. Your second birth, incorruptible. The wages of sin is death, point unto man once to die. That's the first birth. We like our birthdays, we celebrate them, we have it in the bulletin, praise the Lord. But that first birth is, has nothing to do with eternity. There needs to be a second birth, second birth of incorruptible seed by the word of God, which liveth and abideth forever. We're, we're teaching the same truth downstairs in Kids for Truth. The first section of Kids for Truth, probably the first 10 lessons, is on the Bible. So they're learning the basics, right? The Bible is the Word of God. The Bible is truth. The Bible is without error. You can trust the Word of God. Everything in the Word of God is trustworthy and without error. And what it says, it means. And we can read it and we can study it and we can believe it. And we know what in the beginning God created. And God loves you and he sent his son. I mean, they're learning those basic fundamental truths that sometimes we, we forget about as we get a little older here. The word of God, it is the word of God. It liveth and abideth forever. You've heard it said. You could, doesn't mean it's Bible, but two things will last forever, right? Besides God. The souls of man and the word of God. Is there anything else? Now you might say, well, there are some things, you know, but the word of God is eternal because it's God's word. He's eternal. If God were to end, the word of God could end. God's word is eternal. It'll always be Many hymns, the Bible stands, anchored to the rock. Verse 24, and here's the reminder. Our hope in flesh should be in God and his word, not ourselves, because all flesh is just like grass. How's your grass looking right now? Maybe it's getting brown, depending on what you have. Maybe it's pretty much weeds anyways. <laughs> maybe it's crabgrass. You know, maybe it's, it's just, ugh. maybe it, uh, it sort of dies, goes dormant. And maybe you cut it. Uh, maybe, how's the grass doing? Huh? Uh, how about if there was a drought? How long could you keep that? It's, it's just perishable. It's temporary. Our flesh, right? I mean, right? Many of us, you think of the glory days. Oh, back when I was, you were in your prime, high school or college. Back when you, you could show these young whippersnappers. Where is that? It's in the past. It's the flesh. No, it doesn't mean some of you aren't in your prime. <laughs> but our flesh is just, it's temporary. It's weary. Even the best of us, you might get a perfect, clean bill of health. You had a doctor's appointment today, and the doctor said, you are a living, breathing specimen of the perfect man or woman. They want to use your picture on the chart. You can be dead tomorrow. <laughs> you say, oh, I don't understand. My, my heart is like a heart of a... a they said that, I mean, I can't believe it. I got everything's perfect, cholesterol. I mean, I'm just my weight, my fat mass, everything's perfect. Do you keep yourself alive? Is that what keeps you alive? All flesh is grass, as grass, and, and the glory of man. Right? You know, sometimes you, you look at these young ones, you're like, man, if you, if you knew what I, I'd run circles around you. You have no idea what I used to do or what I did. I wish you could go back in time, not just watch videos, I'll show you, you know, sometimes we think, oh, you guys today, you think, you have no idea what we used to do. You know, the glory of man, what I'm known for, right? trophies and success and charts and grades, all of those things are as flowers. They die, they wither, the grass withereth, the flower thereof falleth. We better not put our faith and hope in ourselves, our flesh, our wits, our mind, our education, our training, our money, our ch all that stuff. Uh-uh. What do we need to have it in? But the word of God, the word of the Lord endureth forever. 
We like to talk about investments. I want to make investments. I want to put my money where something that counts. I want to be able to know that it's going to last and no one's going to take it or steal it. It's not going to go down. I'm not going to lose it. Uh, I'm not, I, I want to I, think about it. Then we should have our investments in the Word of God. It's going to last forever. It's eternal. It's always true. I can believe what it says. It's based on God and His Word. My inheritance is already spoken for. I don't even have to worry about it. It's incorruptible. It's undefiled. It doesn't fade away. It's reserved. And I'm kept by the power of God. So, you know what? I'm going to pour myself into people. See that you love one another, the brethren, as well as the lost who need to know the Lord, because they last forever. Their souls are forever. And the Word of God. That will be a good return. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. And, of course, go right into chapter 2. was our, our verse of the year last year. Our theme. We'll stop with this. But notice, because there were no chapters, right? No chapter division. So the thought continues. And this is the word which by the gospel is preached unto you. But notice, now we're going to get into some... <laughs> <laughs> that was all pleasant. Woohoo! Amen. Praise God. Wherefore, laying aside all malice, Pastor hit the definitions of most of these on a Sunday morning message from Ephesians. What's malice? Evil, nastiness, just wicked and mean and ornery. All wi now, whoa, we're talking to Christians. Christians. All right, believers. Lay aside all malice. All guile, that deceptiveness, they appear to be one thing, but you're not. And hypocrisies, and envies, and all evil speakings. As newborn babes, don't ever forget, as we get older, we need to be like newborn babes as far as the desire. Desire the sincere milk of the word, that ye may grow thereby. As we wrap it up tonight, if you're not growing as a Christian... There's the answer right there. If you're not growing, it's not this. Hey, this is not working. It's, you know, something wrong. No, 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 no. No, this is eternal. This is all powerful. This is the word of God. You can't help but grow. And it says, as a ba newborn baby, I, though I may be a mature believer, I should still be like a baby longing for the sincere, pure, 100% unadulterated word of God. And I want to long for it and taste it. And, I want to, and, and if I don't have that, then it's chapter 2, verse 1. I've got things clogging it. There's malice and guile and deception and hypocrisies and evil speakings. And there's things there that God says, it's got to go. And if you're not going to do it, God says, I'm going to bring some trials in. I'm going to bring some testings in. Because you're my child. And any good parent sees their children is not going to be content to see them going astray. As long as they're under their roof, we're going to do everything we can to get rid of that attitude, get rid of that wrong character, get rid of it. We're going to do everything we can. Now, God, same way. You're my child. You're saved. You're mine. It's reserved. I'm not letting you get. A, I'm not letting you act that way. That's as a disobedient child. I want you to grow, but if you're not going to do it, I'm going to bring in some stuff. There's going to be some friction. There's going to be some problems. We're going to bring in some things to reveal to you what I already know there is, so that you can recognize it, Lord willing, with a tender heart, get that right. Say, God, get rid of that. Scoop it away. Cut it out of there, Lord. I'm not gonna, I want to. That my faith and hope might be in God. Today's November 1st. First of the month, really not that challenging. Uh, if you're able to memorize it quick, memorize the section. All right? Practice it. Live it. Share it with someone else. And may we be grateful for the word of God that lasts forever. Father, we love you. We thank you for your word. Lord, you're acquainted with all of our ways. Not a word in our mouth. Not a thought in our mind that you're not aware of. Lord, we might think we know ourselves, but we don't. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The Bible says only you, the Lord, know the heart and try the reins. Lord, I pray that each person here tonight, those watching truly has their salvation based on Jesus Christ and him alone. I pray everyone here tonight has a second birthday that they can look back to when they trust and receive Christ as Savior. In order that they know that and they believe it and they're sure of it. But Lord, I pray that as we walk with you daily, 
Lord, would you turn up the heat in our lives? Lord, would you bring trials? Would you bring testing to reveal to us who we are? Get rid of those things which are hindering our walk, hindering our family, hindering our marriage, keeping us from being all that God wants us to be. Lord, I pray that our faith and hope would be in your word and in God himself. We thank you for the precious word of God. Lord, may we love it, may we live it, may we share it today with someone who doesn't know in Jesus' name. Amen.